I, I, I feel slightly as a, an imposter here because I'm not actually one of the, the team in the Reading project. Although when I was the same height as John was earlier, um, I was a student at, at, at Reading. Um, what I want to do today is to really give you a bit of a, a wider landscape context for the site at Glastonbury Abbey and also to consider some of the impacts that Glastonbury had on the wider landscape around Glastonbury and also to consider perhaps some of the ways that what was going on on the estates of Glastonbury Abbey reflected wider trends in landscape development across southern England. In terms of the landscape around Glastonbury today, it is characterised by this sort of landscape that we can see here with uh, canalised rivers and also a network of uh, agricultural fields bounded by uh, drainage ditches, sometimes with hedges. It's an agricultural uh, landscape. However, at the time that Glastonbury Abbey uh, was first created, the landscape of the Somerset levels, the wetlands that surround Glastonbury, was very, very different. There was a mosaic of really very, very different types of natural environment. So here, for example, um, is Glastonbury itself. The grey stipple is dryland areas. And then in this area here, there was this mosaic of different natural environments. In the coastal areas, there were intertidal mudflats and salt marshes that will have been flooded by the tide perhaps twice a day. A little further inland, uh, the tide would only have reached this landscape perhaps at the highest of spring tides in the winter. And there was more of a fresh water wetland environment rich in reeds and rushes and sedges. And then in the area immediately west of Glastonbury, there was a large area of peatland which was colonised by uh, what is known as sphagnum moss, and it was what's termed a raised bog. So this was the landscape context of Glastonbury Abbey, a range of natural wetland environments. One of the great achievements of uh, Glastonbury Abbey, along with a number of other landowners, was to transform that wetland landscape into the sort of landscape that we see today that is drained with ditches and so on. So, for example, this is the landscape uh, in the early medieval period with this range of, of natural wetland environments. And the major river at this time, the River Brew, actually flowed north from Glastonbury through the Bleeding Pambra Gap and to the north of the Isle of Wedmore. This is the naturally meandering course of that river. One of the achievements of Glastonbury Abbey was to create a completely different drainage system, and that's the drainage system that we see today, where the River Brew actually flows west from Glastonbury along the Brew, either directly to the coast or some of the waters flow through another artificial river known as the Pilro uh, Cut. In the area of the former salt marshes, towards the coast, the landscape that was created is typified by this image here. This is the area right on the coast at Breen. And what we see here are some of the character-defining features of a, a reclaimed wetland landscape. And this is one of Glastonbury Abbey's uh, manors. What we see here is that intricate pattern of fields whose boundaries served as drainage ditches, but also a major network of, of sea walls associated with what are known as sluices, whereby fresh water that falls on the reclaimed landscape can be discharged under the seawall so they can drain out into the tidal rivers 
and hence into the Severn Estuary. There was a, an intricate set of in engineering projects that allowed this former salt marsh to become incredibly fertile and agriculturally productive land. And although in a wetland landscape we often think that the problem was to avoid flooding and get water out of this landscape, that was actually only part of the management challenge for landowners such as Glastonbury Abbey. For in the summer, the water in this landscape was actually an incredibly valuable resource. And we know that within this drainage system, there were networks of small structures known as gates that actually penned up the water in the summer to maintain a high water table. And that was another contributory factor to this being agriculturally an incredibly valuable uh, landscape for Glastonbury. So water wasn't just a problem. Water was actually an asset within this landscape, so long as you had the engineering technology to manage the water table. I mentioned earlier that one of the major achievements of Glastonbury was the canalization of uh, several of the rivers. And what we can see here um, is the River Brew in its modern form next to one of Glastonbury's iconic medieval buildings, the Fish House um, at Mir. And we're starting to get a better idea of when this uh, canalization of the Brew actually occurred. The Brew in its current position is, is documented in uh, 1091, so we know the canalization had, been, uh, had happened by then. And there is also paleo-environmental evidence to show that the old channel of the brew was actually silting up from around about uh, the 9th century AD. So we're probably looking at a date around about approximately the 10th century, maybe into the early 11th century, for the creation of this entirely new uh, watercourse. So although we think of the age of canals as being part of the Industrial Revolution, Glastonbury Abbey was creating canals almost a thousand years um, earlier. Another aspect of the landscape uh, around particularly early medieval uh, Glastonbury, before the reclamation took place, is that although the wetlands had not yet been uh, reclaimed, they were still a resource, but in a slightly different uh, sense. One of the peculiarities in the sort of the history of Glastonbury, and I'm sure there are historians here who know more about this than I do, is the creation of a, a particular jurisdiction that was known as the Glastonbury Twelve Hides. When you map this jurisdiction, which is uh, mapped here. What I think is very, very striking is the extent to which this special jurisdiction of Glastonbury contained vast areas of what at the time would have been unreclaimed wetland. The significance, I think, of this is the number of small islands within the Somerset Levels that lay within the Glastonbury 12 hides, including Beckery, that we have brief mention of just now. Also Mia, where the fish house is, its associated island at West Hay, another island at Godney, Marchy, Nyland, and so on. It's almost as if this jurisdiction, the 12 hides, was created to sort of join up the dots, the various islands in the Somerset Levels that Glastonbury controlled. And I think this is harking back to the origins of Glastonbury as a small monastic community within what, in effect, was a wilderness. And we also see this in the early monastic foundations in the Fenland, that there's a strong correlation with them being located on islands in the, wet, in the, the wetland uh, wilderness. And what is, what is also very striking is the extent to which these small islands 
have evidence uh, for potential evidence, I should say, for early monastic uh, communities. On one of the islands, Fenny Island, for example, uh, in the 19th century, uh, antiquarian references report upward of 200 inhumations were recovered from Fenny Island. Even allowing for a degree of antiquarian exaggeration, clearly there was a cemetery of some date on that island. There is no medieval parish church. Maybe they were Roman. Perhaps they were early medieval. Another very prominent bedrock island right on the edge of the Somerset levels, extending out into the, uh, the Severn Estuary, is Breen Down where there have been well-known excavations of a Romano-Celtic temple and a sub-Roman cemetery. But what I think is, is quite interesting here is that the latest date for one of the burials in the, uh, the cemetery at Bring Down is surprisingly late. And this would actually make it contemporary with Glastonbury. And I would also point to an aspect of the Glastonbury Abbey landscape that I think is very much neglected, which is another one of these bedrock islands at Brent Knoll, so prominent as we drive down at the M5. There's a very substantial hill fort on the top of Brent Knoll. There's uh, antiquarian references to the recording of Roman building material that is suggestive of a Romano-Celtic temple. And I would be prepared to, to wager a small bet that there was another small early Christian community uh, living on Brent Knoll, a, a follow-up project, uh, perhaps. I want to now sort of move on to um, another aspect of uh, the Glastonbury Abbey uh, landscape that recent archaeological work is starting to, to shed light on. The, the distribution map here shows uh, locations in the southwest of Britain that have seen paleo-environmental investigation. Until quite recently, I think uh, palynologists, pollen specialists, hadn't really particularly focused in on the medieval period. This was something that prehistorians have spent a lot of time and effort studying, but I don't think we as medievalists have really paid as much attention as we should to the potential of this paleo-environmental evidence. One of the issues is that so many uh, traditional paleo-environmental sequences have come from upland areas that lie beyond those parts of the landscape that in the medieval period were settled. However, in the southwest, we're actually fortunate in having a very large corpus of paleo-environmental evidence that actually comes from lowland areas and the upland fringes. And what we can see here, for example, in Devon, although we do have some sequences from Dartmoor and from Exmoor, there's also a series of sequences from the lowlands of Devon. And there is another cluster of these pollen sites from the Somerset levels. And these include some of the estates of Glastonbury Abbey. Now, what I'm not going to do is to now show you one of those absolutely unfathomable pollen diagrams. Whenever you go to a conference and you get a pollen specialist, they say, oh, I know the pollen diagrams. Nobody else can interpret them. But I'm going to show you one anyway. Well, I'm not going to do that. Um, all I'm going to do is, is have some, if you like, some, some key headline stories that have emerged from some of the recent paleo-environmental work that has been done in and around the Glastonbury um, area. And I think as we run through these, what you'll see is that there is a, a fairly consistent story emerging. At Baltimore Wall, for example, in East Lynn, there is an increase in the evidence for cereals around about the 8th century. And I must stress the little circa here, the approximate. That's because this is all based on radiocarbon dating, and we have to remember 
the standard deviations that radiocarbon dates come with. So approximately the 8th century, we see an increase in the cultivation of cereals, and there is a further increase around about the 10th century. At Godney Moor, which is well out into the Somerset wetlands, um, we wouldn't expect to see any arable cultivation there. But we do see a sharp reduction in woodland that's suggesting an increased intensity with which the landscape was being exploited. At Street Causeway, around about the 8th century, we once again we start to see the environmental signatures of an increase in arable cultivation. And indeed, the construction of the street causeway itself is showing that there was an increased desire on the part of people around Glastonbury to move around the landscape. It's suggesting, once again, an increased intensity in landscape use. A little distance to the south in the Yo Valley at Ilchester, there was an increased alluviation, an increase in the deposition of sediment on the floodplain of the river. This is poorly dated. It's very approximately the 9th century. It could easily be perhaps the 8th, 9th, 10th century. But what could this increase in alluviation indicate? Well, what it means is there were increased areas of bare soil that was prone to erosion within the catchment of the River Yeo. Why might that have been? Maybe there was an increase in arable cultivation. Or maybe, or, and or, there was a change in arable practices that meant that there was an increased ploughing in the autumn which meant that the fields were bare over the course of the winter, which, of course, in a, a normal year, is when we get most of our rainfall, the exception being this year. So there's certainly changes in agricultural practice going on around about this time. And in the upper Brew Valley, once again, slightly better dating, actually, around about the 8th century, we're seeing this increased amount of sediment being washed into the river system of the Somerset levels. So here we're talking about changes in land use, essentially on the, the dryland catchment of those rivers, not in the immediate location that was sampled for this environmental work. So overall, we're perhaps looking at an increased intensity with which the landscape was being exploited, very broadly in the 8th to 10th century. This could in part relate to changes in agricultural practice, perhaps an increase in autumn ploughing, but maybe the introduction of open fields, which meant that there were far fewer field boundaries within a field system that could have stopped the soil erosion. Is this increase in sedimentation? Because field boundaries were removed to create the well-known open fields, the two, three field system. With this environmental evidence, it's impossible to say exactly where the pollen, for example, that was deposited on Godney Moor was being blown in from. But we know that Glastonbury controlled so much of the land on and around the Somerset levels. In part, these changes in land use must have been going on on some of Glastonbury Abbey's estates. I mentioned earlier the issue of the introduction of open fields. And I think one of the great debates within uh, landscape archaeology and landscape history for the medieval period has been over the origins of villages and open fields. This was a form of landscape that dominates the central zone of England from Dorset through Somerset, up through the Midlands, and into uh, the northeast. And Somerset is a particularly interesting county in which to study the origins of villages and open fields because it lies right on the edge of that zone that saw that transformation of the landscape. 
What we actually have on this image here is actually an analysis of the 19th century landscape within the central portion of Somerset. And each one of these dots illustrates a parish within which the settlement pattern was characterized by a village. Now, the reason why this map is based on 19th century map sources is quite simply we don't have any maps that show us whether settlement was nucleated into villages or perhaps more dispersed and characterized by farmsteads and hamlets from the medieval period. We don't have medieval maps that tell us that. So what we have to use is later cartographic sources and use that as a proxy to try and reconstruct uh, what the medieval landscape might have looked like. Suffice to say, there is a plentiful range of archaeological evidence from Somerset to show that this pattern of villages existed certainly by the 10th century. And perhaps the most famous project is Mick Aston's work at Shapwick, which has shown quite clearly that the planned village existed by the 10th century. And I must emphasize there, by the 10th century, because unfortunately Somerset is largely a ceramic in the earlier part of the early medieval period. I think we probably have to acknowledge Shapwick could have been there in the 8th and the 9th centuries. It's just that there's no pottery available for us as archaeologists to date that occupation. If we then look at the map here, this is a map showing the distribution of the estates for which there is firm documentary evidence that Glastonbury held them in the sort of the 8th to 10th century uh, period. As I'm sure uh, you're aware, some of Glastonbury's records are of uh, somewhat dubious authenticity, um, which is perhaps a polite way of saying they uh, rather wrote their own history. So these are the estates that I think we can be fairly confident that Glastonbury uh, did hold. And what you can see here is that they controlled a vast area of territory across the centre of Somerset. And then they had a series of more isolated manors, such as Marksbury, Rington, Brent, for example, uh, slightly further afield. If we then compare the two maps, I think what we can see is that Glastonbury was clearly not responsible for the origins of villages in Somerset because there are plenty of places in Somerset that had village landscapes that Glastonbury never controlled. But equally, I think we can say that Glastonbury was involved with the movement towards creating villages and open fields because so many of its estates have landscapes that came to be characterized in that way. Now, in some areas, for example, Marksbury up in the northwest of Somerset, this is the uh, characterization of the Marksbury landscape with different forms of land use. And then this here is an extract from the Ordnance Survey first edition six inch map. This is Marksbury, and hopefully you can see on this map, in the area around Marksbury, there's not much other settlement. This is a parish that had a village-based settlement pattern. And this was a Glastonbury Abbey manor. However, in the surrounding parishes, we also see a settlement pattern dominated by villages, but they were not Glastonbury Abbey manors. So I don't think we can say in the northwest of Somerset that Glastonbury was particularly instrumental in shaping the character of the landscape in that region as a whole. And it may indeed have been that Glastonbury was granted the estate at Marksbury and other estates like it that had already seen the creation of villages and open fields. Glastonbury may actually have got in on the act, if you like, after the event. In other parishes, however, I think we perhaps get a hint 
that Glastonbury might have been slightly more significant. And I, I hope this image works here. This is kind of an example of the, the research in progress. This is actually Rington here. Um, and the neighboring parish, and there might be people here who can pronounce this better than I can, Nempnut Throbwell. It's got to be one of the best parish names in the country, mustn't it? Um, what I've done, the little black dots are basically sort of settlements, farmsteads um, in the 19th century. This is Rington itself. There was, there's a zone around Rington where there weren't other farmsteads. And that's because Rington was a village that was surrounded by open fields. In very sharp contrast to the more peripheral parts of the parish and the aforementioned Nempnut Throbwell, where there was an extremely dispersed settlement pattern. This was a Glastonbury manor, this wasn't. Are we seeing here that Glastonbury was involved in restructuring the landscape at Rington? Maybe. If we move further south into the heartland of the Glastonbury estates, this, for example, is uh, the village plan of Shapwick, which has a very distinctive layout. It's almost a ladder-like arrangement with a series of vertical, uh, not vertical, north-south oriented roads with shorter laterals. Now that is actually very similar to several other village plans in the immediate vicinity. For example, Eddington, which also has this strong north-south axis with short laterals, as does Middlezoy to the south. There are broad similarities in these village plans that suggest they might have had a common origin. So was there a Glastonbury way of planning this landscape? Was Glastonbury actually closely involved in the restructuring of these landscapes and the replacement of a dispersed settlement pattern of isolated farmsteads with nucleated uh, villages? Well, I think probably not. And if we look at the immediately adjacent village to Eddington with its ladder-like plan at, at Chilton Polden, quite clearly here you have not got the same village plan. It's actually got completely the reverse axis, more of an east-west axis. It doesn't really have this ladder-like uh, layout. Maybe we've got restructuring of the landscape at different times, but if you look at the sort of the broad structure of the open field system here, these really do have a degree of coherence in terms of their field systems. It's just that it's the village plans that are different. And as one last um, example, um, if we look at uh, the island of Zoe, which is down here, and this map does have Glastonbury on it, Glastonbury's over here. This is a nice example because Zoe was one of these islands in the Somerset Levels. That's the outline of the island. And there were three villages on Zoe. One of them was Middlezoy, whose settlement plan has this broadly north-south ladder-like layout. However, the other two uh, villages, Western Zoyland and Othery, do not have that ladder-like layout. They have, uh, certainly in the case of Othery, a somewhat more amorphous um, uh, settlement plan. Um, there is perhaps a degree of planning evident in, in Western Zoyland but it hasn't got that ladder-like layout. Now, there's been much discussion as to why certain parts of the country saw the development of villages and open fields. And some have argued, for example, that this is down to differences in soils and so on. Well, I think we can see on this one island with uniform soils, we get different village plans. This can't be accounted for in terms of soils. There is human agency in this. And the whole of Zoe was owned by the same landowner. 
Glastonbury Abbey. And so I would suggest that what we're looking at here is a social agency behind the structuring of this landscape that was down a tier from Glastonbury Abbey, and that perhaps it was individual communities within these villes, on these manors, or perhaps the subtenant of Glastonbury, who was responsible for this restructuring. But certainly I can't see a uniform Glastonbury way of structuring these landscapes. So to conclude, Glastonbury had a profound impact upon its landscape, and this included some quite major feats of engineering. For example, the reclamation of wetlands, the canalization of the rivers, that I think can only have been the result of the authority and the resources that a substantial institution like Glastonbury had to hand. I think within this landscape, we shouldn't just see it in a functional way. Reclamation is a functional aspect of landscape management. It improves agricultural productivity. But we, we must also remember that within this landscape, features could have great symbolic significance. And I think these small bedrock islands that protruded through the wetlands in the early medieval period were clearly very significant in the, uh, the early Christian history of this landscape. In the late first millennium AD, I think we're seeing very clear paleo-environmental evidence for an intensification in how this landscape was exploited. And I think it's unavoidable to conclude that this was linked with this transformation of the landscape that saw the creation of villages and open fields. And Glastonbury was part of that process. But I don't necessarily see it as being directly responsible for the reorganization of these landscapes because the morphology of the villages and so on varies so considerably. And so perhaps it was at a slightly lower level within the social hierarchy uh, that these landscapes were reorganized. So I hope I've just introduced Glastonbury in its, its landscape context. And I hope I've shown how Glastonbury was part of a wider movement in the late first millennium AD that saw an increased intensity in landscape management across southern Britain. Thank you.